Okay, let's get started with our fourth and final panel of the day on the topic of competing visions of the construction of desirable political identities and the role of political science. Uh, here again, we'll have three distinguished panelists who will speak for approximately 15 to 20 minutes each. And then we'll have about a half hour for question and answer and comments from the general audience. We hope you'll be active participants um, and also as you wish, use the Zoom uh, chat function to share any personal reflections you might have about Rogers. Um, so our first speaker today at this panel will be uh, David Bateman. Uh, it's nice to welcome David back to Penn in a sense virtually since he received his PhD uh, from here, I believe in 2013. Uh, David's currently associate professor at Cornell in its department of government. He's the author of two prize winning books among many other works. One of these books is Disenfranchising Democracy, Constructing the Electorate in the United States, United Kingdom and France, which was the winner of the J. David Greenstone Best Book in Politics and History Award in 2019. And the other book that he wrote uh, is co-authored with John Lipinski and Ira Ketz Nelson, and it's entitled Southern Nation, Congress and White Supremacy After Reconstruction, which won numerous honors, including the VO Key Prize uh, given to a book in Southern politics and the Hardeman Prize for a book on the topic of the US Congress. Also joining us is Rob Lieberman, who is the Krieger Eisenhower Professor of Political Science at Johns Hopkins University, a prolific scholar of American political development, race in American politics and public policy. Rob is the author of, among other works, um, shifting the color line, race and the American welfare state, which won at least four different prizes. Uh, also the author of Shaping Race Policy, the United States in Comparative Perspective, which won APSA's best book prize from the race, ethnicity and politics section. Uh, and recently in 2020, the book Four Threats, the Recurring Crises of American Democracy. Uh, Rob is intimately connected to the profession of political science. Among other contributions, he has chaired APSA's Task Force on New Partnerships, an initiative that Rogers helped to set up when he was president of APSA. Uh, our third and final panelist uh, speaking uh, this afternoon will be Amy Cabrera Rasmussen, who is a professor of political science at California State Long Beach, where she is chair of the department. She also served on the APSA task force on new partnerships begun during Roger's tenure as APSA president and both in her service to APSA and numerous other professional contexts has worked to promote civically engaged research. Her far ranging scholarship on American politics includes such topics as the interrelation between health and identity, especially as it relates to issues of environmental health, health disparities and reproductive and sexual health. She's currently involved, for instance, in researching environmental health policy as it pertains to her local Long Beach community. A former student of Rogers from Yale, we're delighted to welcome her here along with the other panelists. So thank you all. And now we'll turn things over to David Bateman. Perfect, thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm gonna share some a slide now, or some slides, and hopefully people will see it. All right, so uh, I've now given a bunch of Zoom talks and uh, I've sort of kind of become old hat, but I'm just going to say at the outset that seeing so many uh, familiar faces and so many people who, who I know from Penn, this is, and of course Rogers, this is by far the most anxious I've been <laughs> in the Zoom chat. <laughs> so, you know, if I stumble, that's how it is. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about democracy, democratization, the politics of peoplehood. In some ways, uh, my, my own sort of thoughts and, and, and remarks are going to made it would have fit well with the, the previous panel, but I see very much how they also would fit well with this panel. And so I'll say a little bit about uh, what political science in particular uh, can do in some of these sort of um, in, in some of these domains. Um, I just, you know, this is not who we are. Rogers has a has a book out with that title. Uh, I can only ever hear that phrase now as uh, in Rogers's voice. And I imagine it's the kind of thing he would have said when I submitted a dissertation chapter or something like that. <laughs> David, this is not who we are. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, three things. Um, and sort of one is a type of uh, a, a literature that's been developing around peoplehood identity, especially in the context of democratization. Um, and very much uh, as with Harris's comments in the last panel, 
I want to talk about how Rogers has uh, and his approach to peoplehood has helped both me sort of uh, change my way of thinking, open up new questions, think about old things in, in, in different ways, and how I think that the uh, arguments about peoplehood and identity can sh are showing up in a variety of different ways within the democratization literature in very productive ways. Um, and so there's just uh, at the bottom, I have a quote from Rogers about what peoplehood is. Any and all human associations, groups, and communities that are commonly understood to assert their members owe them a measure of allegiance against the demands of others. I'm going to next move on to something closely related, but I think a little bit different, which is peoplehood and democratic politics, and particularly the question of how democratic politics might be constant, constantly sort of have a tendency to foster and encourage a return to peoplehood uh, as, as a particular sort of site of conflict and democratic contestation. And then ultimately, I think some of the perils of, of, of this and sort of the dangers that come with constantly turning to peoplehood and the notion that peoplehood is never settled. There's real opportunities there and it would be deeply oppressive if it was always settled, but a politics organized around uh, peoplehood, I think also has various, uh, I think it has dangers that we should be attentive to. So this literature on uh, peoplehood, identity, democratization, there's a variety of new work that's coming out, a lot of which sort of highlights how programmatic ideology and content of nationalist claim, uh, cl claims ultimately can prove really important experiences with, uh, and really important variation in experiences with democratization. So one example of this is Maya Tudor's work, both uh, on her own and with uh, Dan Slater. Both of these works sort of looks at how sort of the ways in which peoplehood is narrated, and the reasons why it's narrated in a particular way, but the ways in which it's narrated, how these narrations shape ultimately the experiences of democratic, uh, or sort of the post-independence experience of building a stable state, as well as the long-term experiences of democracy within those countries. Um, my own work has sort of emphasized uh, how the ways in which coalitional claims are accommodated, how this can shape constructions of peoplehood and its institutionalization in ways that join at times disenfranchisement reforms with democ democratize democratizing reforms, sort of bringing them together in some places, not in others. And a final one that I'll sort of just throw up here, uh, because I think it's very closely related to the uh, concept of peoplehood, is this notion of the paradoxical role of conservative parties introduced by Daniel Ziblatt. Uh, in short, if, if you don't know the work, I encourage you to take a look at it. But Ziblatt's arguing that ultimately conservative parties have this crucial role to play in democratization, and especially at the moment of democratization, the early periods of democratization. And that's it, more or less that they need to convince the old regime in some way that they can compete and they do this by altering the axis of conflict, emphasizing questions of religion, empire, nation, ethnicity, race, and doing so in a way that allows conservative parties to still win. But that in order to democratize, they need to both sort of animate the fascists, mobilize the fascists, but also keep them, keep them down and keep them subordinate so that they can't overturn the whole ship. Uh, and I think all of these works and a variety of others, um, and some of the, a lot of the work that Harris was talking about, I think would also sort of potentially fall into this into these categories are allowing us to think about democratization in a way that had not really been thought of for, for a while, in which a lot of uh, the sort of emphasis on democratization really emphasized straightforward redistributive conflicts. Um, I think sort of the political economy work in democratization that has sort of flourished over the last 30 years has been really rich and very helpful, but it has times lost sight of the ways in which democratization was itself a process of people building and was deeply implicated in processes of, uh, in politics of peoplehood. Uh, so that's the first thing. I just wanted to put that out there as sort of one of the ways in which Rogers' work has really helped me and I think others uh, think of, uh, of older, older phenomena that are well sort of well trodden in political science in, in different ways. The other is uh, that I wanted to introduce is this notion of how people who plays out in democratic politics generally. Uh, Rogers has a new book, which I'm going to make a plug for here. Um, but one of the things it argues is that populist politics is a form of peoplehood politics, and ultimately that is going to be, a, I think, a recurring aspect of democratic politics. And it should not be ceded to authoritarian parties with the far right, as has often been done. That those committed to democracy need their own counts of belonging, and these should not simply be reactive. It should not be simply saying, well, we'll do what the right-wing populists say that they're going to do, but we'll do it nicer. <laughs> we'll do it more liberally. Uh, that there must be some purposive content to it. I think this is my Rogers' uh, contribution here, I think sort of fits within a broader set of people who are, or a broader set of literatures that are trying to think through about how democratic politics, not simply at a moment of founding, not simply at the moment of democratization, 
but as an ongoing process, is constantly reopening the question of peoplehood. Uh, Abby earlier it has a forthcoming chapter in a netted volume um, called Popular Sovereignty and Recognition, and she has a lovely argument there that uh, the pre very practices of democratic politics, the very practices of governing, especially sort of policy, are constantly con opening up the contestation and renegotiation of any type of peoplehood, that there's no static people. That there's no way of sort of determining it at the outset, determining it even with a sort of a particular construct, con, uh, construction of uh, national identity through some type of narrative, but that any type of engagement in elections or any type of engagement in policymaking is constantly going to be reopening this question. So the regime, whenever it makes distinctions in the standing and social policy construction of citizens, and uh, Rogers has been wonderful in highlighting how regimes ought to, liberal regimes ought to not simply treat all people the same way, but must recognize the distinctions amongst them. Abby's arguing in a way that ultimately, whenever regimes do these and constructs, constructs citizens in different ways, that this is going to be reopening potentially the boundary problem, this question of who is in and who is out. For a while now, I've been sort of uh, trying to uh, kick around a paper that, um, that asks the question of whether or not democratic politics sort of inevitably, or even not inevitably, might be too strong a word, has a tendency to sort of pick at the scab of peoplehood. And that's a disgusting sort of image. And so I'm sorry, maybe pick at the scars or uh, pull at the scar tissue of peoplehood. That there's something about democratic politics itself and the logic of democratic politics that encourages a return to peoplehood. And I think there's a variety of reasons for this. One, I think democracies can be factories of diversity. And I just, uh, I just mean this in the sense that precisely because of the types of freedoms and uh, openness of democratic regimes, people have the capacity to define themselves in new ways and that people will always be defining themselves in new ways and they'll be defining themselves in ways against other selves and other people. And that this is gonna be perhaps more common in democracies than not. I don't know if that's sort of uh, especially true, but I do think that there is something about the openness of democracies that invites and encourages diversity to proliferate. Uh, proliferate. Um, which I think is sort of the, one of the basic attractions of democracy. Another ways in which democratic politics encourages this return to peoplehood is that it encourages parties, especially political parties, in competition to identify certain social categories of people as socially relevant and valued, and others as not, and to associate themselves with the first and to their opponents with the second. And I think uh, a lot of the work that's, a lot of behavioralist work that's looking at uh, partisan polarization and uh, uh, partisan polarization in the electorate and effect, especially sort of things such as effective polarization really drive this point home that there is something about drawing a line associating yourself with particular groups that is both deeply insidious and invidious but deeply part and parcel of democratic politics and lastly i think that the rich the very rituals of popular sovereignty the very process of going through elections the very process of trying to say that you have uh, popular authorization to even identify the people itself of who should be engaged in these actions compels some type of identification and some type of identification is ultimately gonna be a more or less inclusive one and with that a more or less exclusive one. Uh, but ultimately it's gonna require the question to be raised of who exactly is this people. And so it's not that every democratic election is going to be one in which turns on the politics of peoplehood, but I think that there's going to be a lot that part of the logic of democratic politics as it's organized is going to encourage a return to questions of peoplehood. And that's, you know, no big deal. Uh, like, I'm perfectly fine with that. That strikes me as uh, very pleasant and nice. Um, however, I do think that there is a danger to peoplehood um, and ultimately a danger to a politics of people. I think it's very volatile stuff. And there's a variety of reasons why it might be volatile, both because it, especially insofar as it encourages contrasts uh, between this people and that people um, within what may once have been a, a single people, or even between you are not actually articulated the national uh, peoplehood or the actual relevant political community, but we are, that those types of uh, questions can become very existential. It also raises it, it, uh, the question of the democratic regime itself. So this is Dankwa Rustow in, in his uh, famous transitions articles. One of the things he'd argued was that there's this single background condition to democracy, national unity. The vast majority of citizens in democracy to must be to be must have no doubt or mental reservations as to which political community they belong to. And in some sense, he's thinking of nations, right? He's thinking of Turkey, he's thinking of Sweden, he's thinking of the United Kingdom, 
uh, and at various points suggests that each of them have varying conditions of national unity, which strikes me as right. But on the other hand, he's talking about political communities more broadly. If ultimately we're at the position, a political community is at a position where deep factions within it ultimately think that they have nothing in common with the others, with others who are within that political community, and that their rise to power is itself something of an existential threat, and is itself an indication that that political community has been subverted, that this is a type of politics that can be deeply, deeply destabilizing. And so if on the one hand, I think that democratic politics um, is constantly inviting a return to peoplehood, I also wonder whether democracy itself can survive the politics of peoplehood, uh, whether it can just survive the very contestation over these things. And you know, I think Rogers might say, yes, maybe, optimistically. If those stories are sufficiently resonant, respectful, and articulated, uh, the, the, the sort of three that he has, articul that he has offered in a, variety, in a variety of settings. Um, and there was a discussion about sort of resonant, uh, in the previous panel, there was a discussion about resonant uh, stories, respectful stories, reticulated stories, how those uh, could be unpacked a little bit more. But there's, a, there's something sort of I find troubling, or at the very least worrisome, about this reliance ultimately on resonant, respectful, or reticulated stories or stories at all. And I guess I might ask the question, can democracy survive the politics of peoplehood in a slightly different way? And just to take it in sort of a Rusto vein and to ask, well, what are the constraints on, or what are the boundaries to the politics of peoplehood? Are there any boundaries to the politics of peoplehood? And it strikes me that one of the sort of the distinctive characters of organizing political conflict around questions about who is in and who is out, or around questions of who are we, or what is the purpose of us being together? What is our meaning? Is that there aren't any obvious constraints to it. You now, economic conflict, which I have no idea how to spell. I think economic conflict has some real constraints, right? There's a limit to what you can do in a given context. Uh, if you if if you were to national or if a political party were to sort of propose nationalizing the means of production tomorrow in the United States, it would not go very far. Right? There's a definite hard edge within any particular place to what you can get away with. And it varies a lot. It can be wider in some places, uh, biased in a more conservative or a more liberal direction, uh, depending where you are. But there's a type of limit to it. Peoplehood, I think, is bounded only by the resonance of the social construct or the story. Uh, how much it resonates with voters. I don't think it's bounded by how respectful it is. Uh, if it were, that would be a lovely world. I don't think it's bounded by how articulated it is. I think it is bounded, and I don't even think it's necessarily, as we discussed in the previous panel, was discussed in the previous panel, I don't think it's bounded by how true it is. It's bounded by how resonant it is. And I find that thought terrifying um, as a constraint. Because while I think there is a certain, uh, some of the, the conversation in the previous panel emphasized how how the various reasons why it might be difficult for the left or for liberals to come up with resonant stories of peoplehood. My worry is that there's actually a, a lot of resonant stories of peoplehood. Um, we're very, very good at finding little ways in which we can uh, scriptively uh, categorize some group as outside the people, as somehow a perversion on the people, as a subversion on the people. Um, coming up with new forms of hate seems to be a great national export of the United States. Like, there are various ways in which we are very, very good at finding categories of stigmatization and roping those into larger narratives about national belonging. So I do think that perhaps there might be a uh, harder time for liberals, although I, I take Mark Raver's point about sort of the decline of the religious left seriously. Uh, but I worry that if there is, if the boundary to people, the politics of people, what uh, the politics of peoplehood, what, imposes constraints and say, well, it can't really go past here without losing votes, that that's not actually that bounded at all. And if that's the case, there's nothing, there seems to be very little to stop a constant recurrence to it in a way that I find deeply terrifying. All right, so what about the role of political science? Well, <laughs> I, I, I have no great answers for you, um, other than I think that we should be asking questions about what types of institutions might be able to constrain the politics of peoplehood to be more respect, respectful and articulated. And also to ask what kind of options we have if, as I think one way to interpret the, uh, the current situation in the United States is, if people politics, peoplehood politics threatens to undermine democratic institutions itself, if the conflict over peoplehood becomes too intense. 
can we take a time out? What are our options? Uh, so I've gone over, and my apologies for, for that. Um, so I'd just like to thank you, Rogers, and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thanks, David. Uh, we'll turn to you, Rob. Thanks very much, Jeff. Um, um, uh, and thanks for inviting me to be part of this event. It's very exciting to see all of these threads of, of Rogers's career uh, come together and be in conversation with each other. And I'm especially happy to be on this uh, panel with David and Amy. Um, so in contrast to David, I'm gonna lean a little bit more heavily on the second part of the title of the panel, the role of uh, political science in contributing to more constructive politics and robust citizenship. Um, I, I focus on this um, not just to celebrate Rogers's, I think, unique and critical role in this aspect of our professional lives, uh, but mostly because this is the capacity in which I've worked with Rogers most closely, at least in the last couple of years. Um, unlike many of, of you who have spoken today or others uh, in the room, um, I've never been Rogers's colleague nor his co-author. Um, nor even formally his student. In fact, as he never, really never tires of reminding me, I managed to make it all the way through uh, Yale as a political science major in the 1980s without taking a single one of his courses, um, which I can at this point chalk up only to the folly of youth. Um, so unlike Keith Whittington this morning, sadly, I can't blame any of my subsequent mistakes on uh, Rogers. Um, there are other people on the call who bear some of that responsibility, um, but this is about Rogers, so I won't call them out, but you know who you are. Um, um, but, but even though I've never really been a formal student or collaborator um, in an academic sense, I'm very happy to count Rogers as a longtime friend, as a role model, um, as a frequent interlocutor on a lot of common substantive interests and as a mentor, um, as our careers have intersected in a lot of ways. Um, I've learned a lot, not just about, as I said, the, 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 um, uh, our shared substantive interests, but also about how to be a dedicated, ethical and humane scholar. Uh, and my relationship with Rogers culminated uh, a couple of years ago in the extraordinary opportunity that he gave me when he uh, became president-elect of APSA, as Jeff mentioned, in 2017, and asked me to chair his presidential task force on new partnerships. True to form, Rogers took a good idea, the APSA presidential task force, and made it better. Since Theda Scotchpole um, first um, mobilized a group of colleagues when she appointed a task force on inequality in American democracy, uh, when she became president in 2002, APSA presidents have convened annual task forces that have typically been um, study groups on urgent public issues on which political science and political scientists have something to say. But Rogers's ambition was not really to study a particular problem, but to um, nudge or maybe shove the profession toward the task of finding solutions um, and to refocus our professional orientation away from what's become a somewhat um, um, narrow and often stifling scholasticism um, and toward more engagement and connection with the world. Um, as Jeff mentioned, Amy was also an active member of our task force, as was um, Harris Marlonis. Um, and I, I know that Amy's going to talk about some of the specific things that we accomplished under Rogers' leadership. Um, what I want to do is not talk about Rogers' work or my own particularly, but rather about some of the it, our project's intellectual foundations, um, which bear directly on this theme um, about the, the role of political science and I think connect some of the threads that we've been talking about over the course of the day. Um, briefly, let me just say that there are a couple of aspects of the contemporary political context um, that, that shape the, the surroundings of our project that are worth noting. First um, is polarization, which in addition to being an important object of scholarly attention, poses, I think, a growing challenge to the health of democratic societies around the world, as many of the people on this call have, have, have written about. Um, second, we confront growing mistrust in the very foundations of our professional enterprise, 
um, claims about knowledge, science, and expertise, the things that we aspire to as, um, as scholars. People, people increasingly tend to believe things that corroborate their worldviews, regardless of whether they're true. And as we've heard in the last panel and in David's presentation, that kind of narrative um, approach to understanding the world has both benefits and drawbacks. Um, but for us, I think it's a very, puts us as scholars and as uh, uh, scientists, and I use that word advisedly, um, it puts us in a risky position. A generation ago, Daniel Patrick Moynihan was reputed to have said, everyone is entitled to his opinion, but not to his own facts. Today, we live in a world of alternative facts um, and contending stories about how the world works as, um, as a lot of discussion today has reminded us. Under these pressures, Contemporary political science's commitment to the dispassionate and objective scientific accumulation of knowledge seems in some ways more compelling and necessary than ever before. But at the same time, that stance seems also more insupportable than ever. This posture of the neutral scientific observer and explainer increasingly, I, I worry, clashes with our commitments to democracy and justice that now um, uh, that no doubt drew many of us to the study of politics to begin with. This was the tension um, that under Rogers's gentle but insistent prodding our task force uh, tried to bridge. Um, and I want to unpack that tension a little bit um, uh, historically. The practice of political science, I would suggest, has not always been so distant from normative concerns or from direct engagement with public affairs and discourse. Along with the other social sciences, American political science came into being in the late 19th century, essentially as what you might call the, the R&D arm of the emerging liberal reformist impulse of that era, the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Early social scientists were concerned with observing diagnosing and treating the growing ills of a society and a political economy that were changing rapidly and dramatically through processes of industrialization, emancipation, immigration, and urbanization. Challenges such as rising inequality, racial tension, deepening poverty, urban slums characterized by overcrowded housing and deteriorating health, labor strife, industrial accidents, employment, and so on and so forth exacerbated by regular financial panics, a crisis in agriculture. Um, these and other problems consumed both, ref both reformers who sought to mobilize and enlarge the state to address them, and their antagonists who saw these, evil, these ills as evidence of, of social or moral decay. Social scientists by and large cast their lot with the former group, with progressives who sought to ameliorate social problems and to use the state as a vehicle to do so. The growth and professionalization of the social sciences then went hand in hand with the growth of the state, particularly in the United States and Britain, but elsewhere as well, um, as policymakers came to rely on technical expertise to manage the increasingly complex challenges of industrial capitalism. Mingled with this reform impulse was the progressive era embrace of order, professionalization and elite led organization in which all of these things are, are, are arenas in which social scientists figured prominently. The social sciences themselves participated in this frenzy of organization around the turn of the 20th century. Most of the major scientific uh, professional organizations were formed around this time, including the APSA, which was founded in 1903. At the same time, the social sciences were of course um, devoted um, to another important strand of the progressive impulse, um, and that was scientific racism, which formed an equally important part of political science's origin story. 19th century race science, which brought together biology, statistics, and public policy, emerged partly out of the American constitutional structure, which of course required an accurate count of both free and enslaved people in order to apportion congressional representation according to the constitution's three fifths clause. Therefore, from the very first US census in 1790, this clause was interpreted to mean classifying Americans by race, which was made possible 
over the course of the 19th, 18th century and into the 19th by the emerging quote unquote science of racial classification. The subsequent history of racial classification as a tool of social legibility and control is, is of course well known. Um, and the early social sciences were deeply implicated in that history. Even as race science evolved, social scientists kept its concepts, classificatory schemes and implications alive through the rest of the 19th century and well into the 20th. The social Darwinism of prominent social scientists such as Herbert Spencer, William Graham Subner, John Burgess and William Dunning, um, the last of whom served as president of both the American Historical Association and of the APSA. Um, um, the, these, um, the, the views of these uh, men was a prominent feature of the early scientific study of politics in the United States. Two other early absent presidents, A. Lawrence Lowell and Woodrow Wilson are known um, uh, for their racist views and for perpetuating racially exclusionary policies as president of Harvard, president of Harvard and Princeton universities respectively. Um, and in Wilson's case as president of the United States. Um, I'm, I think I'm obligated at this point uh, to point out that Wilson's uh, PhD in political science was from my own department, um, but we'll move on. Um, the racist biological and social science of this era found expression of course in the eugenics movement um, to which many social scientists were both prominent contributors while others were, were critics. As the social sciences emerged, they had to grapple with an inherent tension between scientific objectivity and political purpose. Early social reform efforts emerging partly out of currents in American Protestantism and the social gospel movement of the second half of the 19th century took on a strong moral tone of uplift and correction but as the moral and religious impulse gave way to a new liberalism and with it a more economistic understanding uh, of social problems, the imperatives of, social, of scientific knowledge began to overtake those of reformism. And in the United States, ironically, the failure of progressive era reform movements for national social reform, such as unemployment insurance and old age pensions, along with the late and slow development of a professional civil service, limited opportunities for social scientists to staff the state and manage reform from the inside as was possible in other systems where the state developed um, earlier and more robustly. By the middle of the 20th century, American liberalism turned away from its broader ambitions of economic and political reform and embraced a narrower vision of individual rights and accommodation with corporate capitalism. American social science followed suit. Um, it increasingly adopted the language and methods of positivism and eschewed the normative reformism of earlier generations. Economics, of course, as a profession, led this transformation uh, in the turn toward the neoclassical synthesis, which brought the trappings of mathematical precision to Keynesian theory. Um, uh, enviously, uh, political science with the behavioral revolution um, similarly began to stress rigorous observation and ever more precise measurement of individual and group behavior, particularly using emerging techniques in survey research and statistical analysis and the systematic and scientific study of uh, political phenomena. This behavioral turn trained the discipline's attention principally on questions of citizenship, of interactions between citizens and states and the dynamics of political power. Um, uh, Robert Dahl, one of behavioralism's pioneers, articulated this stance most starkly in 1961. And the, uh, Dahl said, quote, the empirical political scientist is concerned with what is, not with what ought to be. The behaviorally minded student of politics is prepared to describe values as empirical data, but qua scientist, he seeks to avoid prescription or inquiry into the grounds on which judgments of value can properly be made. This was probably perhaps the most prominent and important political scientist in the second half of the 20th century. Um, this is the exact opposite of the views that Harris earlier uh, this afternoon, I think rightly ascribed um, to Rogers and their views that Dahl veered away from toward the end of his career. Um, but this, there's, I can't think of a better 
uh, statement of the sort of um, scientific approach to politics, the value-free, pure scientific approach uh, to politics that characterized much of political science in the late 20th century. Under the sway of these scientific aspirations, political scientists largely turned away from the reformist concerns of an earlier generation, Although in significant measure, many leading political scientists remained committed to broader concerns of preserving and sustaining a liberal democratic political order, especially um, as Ira Katznelson has taught us in the shadow of the horrors of totalitarianism in the wake of the Second World War. Despite these trends, uh, political scientists have always at some level mingled analysis with advocacy and focused attention on big and consequ consequential questions with a reformist edge. The health and functioning of democracy, the capacity of politics and government to promote human flourishing and social welfare, the maintenance of peace and international order among other issues that political scientists have taken on. Um, in the late 19th century, for example, Wilson's, Woodrow Wilson's work on what he saw as congressional dysfunction amounted to a powerful argument for parliamentary government. Picking up on similar themes a half century later, um, APSA's Committee on Political Parties at mid-century responded to the perceived centrism of American politics, um, that stymied proposal for, for social and economic reform, um, and called for more programmatically distinct and electorally responsible parties in the United States. That's something that we can file under the category of be careful what you wish for. Um, a generation later, scholars of the welfare state began to ask questions about the factors underlying what seemed to be a divergence between Europe's more generous and comprehensive systems of social provision and the more limited and stingier American system. Uh, and recent studies of rising economic inequality have drawn attention to its troublesome consequences for representation and democratic responsiveness, both in the United States and in other democratic systems. All of this is to say that, uh, that uh, political scientists have similarly contributed productively to both scholarly debates and public conversations on a whole range of important topics. Um, and so the, this line that um, we tried to draw in the 20th century between science and advocacy, um, it, it turns out to be a very fuzzy one and one that's difficult to, to, to delineate. Um, despite these important interventions, however, professional imperatives in the discipline have generally tilted the balance away from external impact and toward highly specialized intramural professionalism, away from activism and toward scientism, as Robert Putnam put it uh, some years ago in his absent presidential address. This drift um, risks rendering the discipline more self-enclosed and scholastic, and ultimately less able to realize its dual promise of knowledge and social benefit. As Rogers argued in his absent presidential address just a couple of years ago, the discipline for all the variety of subject, scope, and method that it increasingly embraces still um, I fear, um, misses opportunities to promote and reward much of the civic engagement, education, and research work that could further amplify its voice in contemporary society and strengthen its case as a useful profession. And this is where um, I want to circle back as I, as I close to Rogers and to our task force. Um, um, this is where we tried to intervene um, by thinking through some of these problems, um, thinking through some of the barriers that political scientists face in trying to move beyond the sort of internal uh, validation, professional validation um, that we're all accustomed to. Um, uh, and this is where we tried to intervene by seeding a series of collaborative programs in precisely uh, uh, these areas, teaching, research, and civic engagement. Amy, I think, is going to talk about some of these efforts in a moment. Um, as I've, as I've tried to suggest, this was not a trivial intervention, um, nor was it, uh, we like to think, just some marginal programmatic tinkering. Rather, it was an attempt both to recall political science to its roots um, and to uh, give it a, a push uh, to overcome some of its own built-in uh, limitations. Rogers, I think, um, taught us and urged us to remember that at its very best, political science can do both of these things. It can pursue knowledge and it can improve politics and citizenship. 
um, especially at a very, very worrisome time for dem democratic and pluralistic societies. Uh, while a lot of the efforts that we, um, we set in motion are still in their infancy and some of our the task force's programs have been interrupted a bit by the pandemic of the last few years. It's our hope that they'll contribute to this effort to sort of pull the profession a bit toward its more engaged and reformist roots with the honesty and courage not just to re-engage with a profoundly broken world, but also to confront some of the more shameful blind spots in our discipline's own history. And if we succeed at all in that endeavor, um, it's hard, I think, uh, to think of a more fitting tribute to Rogers's determined and ethical intellectual leadership. Thanks. Thank you. Amy. Good afternoon. Um, as all here surely know very well, uh, Roger Smith has called himself a student of the history of American political science. Um, over his career, he has offered a series of critical but always constructive analyses of the discipline through numerous scholarly pieces, participation in organized efforts such as Perestroika, and via many formal talks, um, including, as Rob mentioned, a presidential address. Um, I think we can agree then that he's one of the best students of the history of our discipline, but I would go further to say that he's perhaps one of the best teachers on the subject as well. Um, particularly important to me, Rogers has been among those most powerfully and consistently drawing attention to our discipline's public impact and relevance. The importance of ensuring our research is legible to various publics, as well as suggesting ways to bolster our credibility and fulfill our responsibilities as scholars and teachers, and much more. Among these, there's one piece of Rogers' work that I come back to time and again, partly because it has informed my own research, but perhaps even more so because I have found that it resonates very well with students who are trying to grapple with where they, as fledgling scholars of politics, fit into the discipline. I found that it helps them to situate the current state of political science into a much larger intellectual and historical trajectory. It helps them to frame and contextualize their own potential contributions. Um, the piece I'm referring to is Rogers' essay, The Puzzling Place of Race in American Political Science, published in PS in 2004. Uh, many of you likely know this piece. Um, in it, I think what he does best is succinctly describe how we have studied or not studied matters of race and arguing that political science scholars moved from a period of explicit racism in our key writings to a time characterized by mainstream neglect and separation of scholarly works on race and at the time that he was writing into a period where race had become a major subject of research across many subfields and specializations. He argues that the impact of the early eras of scholarship was not restricted to the discipline or the academy, to our teaching of students or the pages of our flagship journals, but that it also informed and impacted American public policy, domestic and foreign. He discusses how these patterns set political science apart from other cognitive disciplines and not in a positive way. He holds, like others who have written on this topic, that this trajectory cannot be explained solely by racism within the profession, by preferences for other types of social and political advocacy, or a substantive tendency to focus on elites and the institutions in which they operate. He also argues that the manner in which American political scientists generally have conceptualized race and other identities as extra political is as well a key aspect of our disciplinary treatment of the subject. For me, as someone who studies the interaction between identities, policy, and discourse in communities, this analysis has always resonated greatly and created a productive synergy with the other conceptualizations focused on social and political construction of race that are found within our discipline and beyond. What I found always most compelling about this piece, however, is the appeal that he makes in the essay's conclusion that as a discipline, political science has a responsibility. He says, not just as much, but more than other Americans to do better than we had in earlier, um, and in some cases, even in the current era of our scholarship and engagement. I interpret that as saying that to claim oneself as a scholar of politics today, we have a duty to recognize and attempt to counter this earlier history of our chosen discipline. In the 2004 piece, he's talking about political science's study of race specifically and very clear implications follow. But I would say as well in it, he provides a very grounded and vitally important example of how what happens within our discipline is inextricably linked to broader society and politics in the US context and beyond. How our discipline has a role in crafting understandings and outcomes that can affect real people's lives and what our government does or does not do. And of course, that the reverse is true as well, 
the discipline is embedded within larger social and political contexts, and this is something that we must always keep front of mind. In short, his appeal regarding our study of race and identity is just one example of broader asks that Rogers had made of us in many of his other writings and speeches. Here and elsewhere, including his APSA presidential address in 2020 entitled, What Good Can Political Science Do? From Pluralism to Partnerships, he asked us to take our role as scholars of politics seriously, and in many cases, to do better. Rogers is a keen observer of our role within higher education and the academic enterprise. He showcases in particular the current patterns and incentives within the discipline and higher education more broadly that can undermine our ability to accurately grasp our subject matter, and perhaps just as importantly, can reduce the public's trust in our ability to contribute to and improve politics, power, and governance. He highlights forcefully what he calls the deep troubles of the larger political world and how they can create challenges for our discipline. And instead of responding by retreating into the ivory tower, he urges us to engage more closely with communities and civic organizations. Much of today's conference has rightfully been about the importance and impact of Rogers' conceptual and scholarly work. I would argue, however, that his work as a friendly but forceful critic of our discipline will have an equal legacy. It is true that his work on the discipline is built on the foundation of his rich scholarly work, but I believe his contributions to the discipline and how we imagine ourselves as political scientists will be also looked back on as very significant. To illustrate my point most clearly, I would like to add a bit to what Rob talked about in terms of the work of the task force on new partnerships that Rogers created during his APSA presidency and link them directly to the larger ideals and goals that Rogers has espoused in his writings on the discipline. As Rob noted, the aim of the Smith task force was to propose ways to strengthen political science itself in the areas of research, teaching and learning and civic engagement. In the end, I think there were seven new APSA programmatic initiatives proposed and many of them implemented during the time of the task force. I can say that personally, the work of the task force and what continues to unfold from it have been among the most meaningful work of my career um, and has given me renewed hope that our discipline um, can meet its potential in many ways. I was honored to serve on two of the three task force subcommittees and chaired one. Um, the Civic Engagement Subcommittee, and I also served on the Teaching and Learning Subcommittee. Don't ask me how I ended up doing double duty. I don't quite recall, but I'm guessing I volunteered for it, um, and luckily it was definitely worth it. Um, in the process, I was able to join Rogers, Rob, and my other colleagues in advancing four key initiatives. The peer-to-peer -peer pedagogical partnership, um, what has become APSA Educate, the, the website, um, APSA's Distinguished Award for Civic and Community Engagement, and the APSA Institute for Civically Engaged Research. Um, key colleagues working on the teaching and learning projects were, of course, Rogers and Rob, along with all of the teaching and learning subcommittee members. This included Tyson King Meadows, Janet Kirkpatrick, Cami Shea, and Renee Van Vechten. Um, in addition to Rogers and Rob, key members of the Civic Engagement Subcommittee were Valeria Sinclair Chapman, Peter Levine, as well as Hari Han. Um, Amanda Gray, who was the former director of the APSA Centennial Center, was integral to all of the task force's efforts as well. So I wanted to just share a little bit about two of the task force initiatives that I mentioned, um, the ones that emanated from the Civic Engagement Subcommittee. Um, I picked these because I've had the opportunity to thoroughly participate in not just the creation, but also their implementation over time. Um, and I also do so because I believe they fit closely with the larger goals of Rogers's work on the discipline and that their cumulative impact will be substantial parts of his, um, of his own personal and professional impact over time. So first I would like to discuss the APSA Distinguished Award for Civic and Community Engagement. You know, we saw this award as part of a larger strategy, which um, Rob alluded to, um, to really alter disciplinary norms and to encourage political scientists to formulate and deploy new efforts within the area of civic engagement. When we were working on the initial proposal, I conducted a review of the APSA current awards and compared them to those in related disciplines. Um, there are many in this room, I'm sure, who have um, received one of those different APSA awards, so you're probably quite familiar with them. Um, but what I found was that APSA offered 28 separate awards. Um, the largest share was focused upon specific types of research, publications, you know, books, articles, papers, dissertations, um, most often with specific subject areas um, attached for example, ethnic and cultural pluralism, political philosophy, international law. 
There were also several teaching awards and a set of lifetime or career level awards. A few touched on aspects of engagement, but not in the way that we envisioned it. Um, taken as a whole, these awards are described officially by APSA as being aimed at defining excellence within our discipline. Put another way, those honored with an APSA award are indicative of what is seen as the highest achievement one can have as a political scientist. Symbolically, these awards provide signposts and establish boundaries for scholars beginning their careers, helping to identify which work is deemed most valuable by their peers in the profession. It can also affect one's assessment of the tasks into which they ought to put their efforts and expertise. So in crafting the award, we took care to ensure that there was what we felt to be a unique set of criteria, not only for potential awardees, but also for the types and timing of work. Um, again, because we wanted to do that nudge um, that Rob was mentioning before. So part of our discussion was to have, have it be clear that political scientists could be selected on their own or in a collaborative team. So it could be an individual or a group award. Um, also in partnership with others in or beyond the academy, um, community organizations, government actors, et cetera. Um, for that matter, the award could go to a political scientist who was not currently even in higher education, but was working in outside in innovative ways that utilize their expertise. Um, it was also important to us that the honor could be given for a significant singular contribution, not necessarily as a cumulative or end of career award. Um, we did so partly because we knew that these nominations of early and mid-career scholars would be encouraged by these choices and so could positively impact an awardee's individual tra career trajectory and also facilitate their subsequent contributions. So we wanted this to be something that people could really utilize to help to bring um, credibility to the type of work that they were doing um, at various points in their career and perhaps utilize it as a way to be able to build on um, future efforts. The type of work that we sought to identify um, was specifically civic engagement activity that merged knowledge and practice um, going beyond research to have an impact beyond the profession or the academy. Um, this work could include, for just two examples, uh, work that has demonstrable benefit to the public, including to democratic processes and outcomes and or civic engagement, or work that practically addresses contemporary policy issues and conflicts. And finally, we had a, many goals for the new award, um, but we really were hoping to modify reward structures. We were hoping to expand the sense of the range within which new PhDs, or even some of us more advanced in our careers, um, understand career success. Um, we hoped it might allow for greater consider consideration of options beyond academia or through bridging academic with political community or policy work. So sort of breaking down some of the silos in which sometimes um, we're operating. And we also wanted to develop disciplinary standards of excellence for civic and community engagement. Um, finally, we also wanted to encourage um, research and practically focused partnerships, um, and especially those that had um, clearly elaborated and direct public relevance. So again, the award was not envisioned on its own as a way to accomplish all these goals, but we felt that its inclusion within the APSA award structure and as part of a larger civic engagement strategy by the association, it could bring significant direct and cascading effects. Um, thus far, two individuals have received the award. The inaugural honor went to Mark Howard of Georgetown for the Prisons and Justice Initiative that works to address incarceration and recidivism in the local DC area. Um, in 2021, Monolina Crook of Rutgers learned the, earned the honor for her research engagement and impact on matters of violence against women. And a third award will be given out this year. Um, Many people, again, as I mentioned earlier, all of the uh, members of the Civic Engagement Subcommittee on the task force were essential to this award being created. Uh, but there have also been a number of individuals who served as part of the selection committees for these awards. Um, I particularly would like to thank the people who served on the inaugural award committee with me. Um, th that was Elizabeth Beaumont, Ethan Frey, Chris Karpowitz, and Veronica Reyna. Now, finally, I would like to discuss the APSA or APSA Institute for Civically Engaged Research, or we call it ICER for short, because it's a, it's a, it's a mouthful. Um, the project of the task force, I would say, they, I think may contribute most to the kinds of reforms to our discipline that Rogers has championed over his career. Um, ICER again was created by the Civic Engagement Subcommittee and the task force more generally. Um, Valeria Sinclair Chapman, Peter Levine, and I serve as ICER's directors and helped found it, along with Amanda Gregg of APSA. Um, other APSA staff members, including Zeneb Alam and now Sean Delahanty, among others, have been integral to the Institute's efforts over the years. 
And we're also lucky to have an incredible advisory board for the Institute that includes a diverse array of political scientists who are situated both in and outside of academia. Um, creating ICER was quite a whirlwind. I still find it shocking to say that we went from proposal to creation in less than a year, but that's what we did. Um, the first institute was held in 2019 at Tufts University's um, Tisch College of Civic Life. Um, the institute welcomed our admitted and enrolled participants from a range of career stages, institutions, research interests, geographical locations, and backgrounds. And that was really by design. We wanted um, many types of diversity to be able to be represented at the institute. Um, it's a four-day institute, and over those four days, um, our inaugural ICER participants engaged via formats that included small groups, seminar-style discussions, interaction with established scholars, the directors, and peer-to-peer -peer collaboration. Um, the first cohort has been incredibly cohesive and productive. They've developed writing accountability groups, collective research symposia, and have successfully applied for an APSA Special Project Fund grant, among other individual grants that they have been able to succeed in getting on their own. Um, while the 2020 Institute had to be canceled due to COVID, in 2021, we reimagined it for our pandemic times in a virtual format over five days um, and with greater opportunities for interaction. Most fundamentally, I would say ICER's aim is to help to further institutionalize civically and community engaged research within political science. Um, and again, we do this in a few ways by building upon existing work and best practices of the discipline and beyond um, to develop a critical mass of political scientists. And our plan is to do it cohort by cohort. Um, the Institute introduces basic norms of this type of research, um, approaches and expectations that one might take. Um, it creates opportunities for collaboration between newer and established scholars. And again, encouraging those reciprocal partnerships, much like the award. Um, it's also our hope that in receiving admission, participating in the Institute um, and building upon this foundation, um, that it will help to elevate civically and community engaged research as a valuable part of the profession writ large um, and in smaller individual ways within departments and programs and even individual career trajectories. I'm happy to say that a little over a month from now, Valeria, Peter, and I will be meeting again in person back at Tufts um, to welcome our third ICER cohort. And when we finish at the end of June, um, we will approach a number that would have literally been inconceivable when we started this effort back in 2019. We will have 60, five dozen um, political science scholars that have gone through ICER. Um, while we've not yet hit a critical mass, I don't know what that magic number is, um, I do think that we are making substantial progress. Um, with each subsequent cohort comes the potential for even greater impact, especially as they make connections with one another, as the productivity and success of initial cohorts begins to change the status quo for subsequent ones. Um, and they are adding to the literature um, in which to ground their research. They're altering the publishing and grant contexts and creating models um, in terms of ethics, re reciprocity, um, and research design. Our ICER participants were already amazing political science scholars, but our goal is that participating in the Institute gives their projects and careers a boost and contributes to their sense of belonging within the discipline, which often people who seek to do this kind of work, you know, don't always feel that it's um, rewarded or valued. Um, in 2019, uh, we were lucky to have Rogers help to welcome our first cohort of ICER fellows. Um, he shared the following echoing what he said in the 2004 piece and in many other sites in between. He said, we need to do our work better, both to achieve deeper and truer understandings of politics, and to persuade the growing numbers who doubt our worth that we have something to contribute to the world. He added as well that the best way to meet all these needs is to expand greatly our commitments and skills in doing civically engaged research. If political scientists are working actively and collaboratively with a wide variety of groups in defining and exploring the issues we address, we are less likely to miss big developments that are occurring outside of the academy, but not within it. And he also said that he thinks many of these groups and organizations with whom we do civically engaged research may come to see us as partners in helping them to understand and deal constructively with the difficulties they face. There is, of course, much work left to do on all of these fronts, and so the work continues. Um, I'm especially excited about all of the projects and scholarship of our ICER cohort members on a host of really important political issues ranging from immigration to the environment and so much more. Um, I can't really do all of, the, um, all of the task force initiatives justice here, of course, but what I hope you've heard and what I shared is that 
Um, while these and the other initiatives were guided by the ideals that Rogers has long espoused, he also made the task force a truly collaborative space where each of us was empowered to bring our own ideas into the process, um, even when there were differences that we found among ourselves or with him in substance or method. Um, as a group, we had dozens, if not more um, than dozens of robust discussions, which I still fondly recall. Um, on Zoom, we were early adopters um, before the pandemic, but also in Chicago, Houston, Washington, DC, and Boston um, over the course of more than the year of his presidency. Um, more than his presence a year plus longer um, before and after. Um, and again, those conversations have continued as Rogers encouraged us to put ideas into practice. Um, indeed, the work of the task force is still ongoing for many of us. So as I started um, at, the, at the beginning um, of my time this afternoon, I said that Rogers' scholarship, of course, deserves significant attention, but equally important and lasting in impact to my mind is his work as what I called a friendly but forceful critic of our discipline. In particular, I would venture to say that his concrete endeavors to craft new institutional structures, to modify prevailing incentives, and to create spaces for learning and support, especially for civic engagement and civically engaged research, but also for teaching and for folks situated in all types of colleges and universities, these will be among his most esteemed accomplishments. Um, that is, again, if we all do our part to continue these efforts and build on them in ways we cannot yet imagine. So thank you to my fellow panelists, as well as the organizers of the conference, the Andrew Mitchell Center. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak here today. And of course, thank you to Rogers and to Mary, um, your scholarship and engagement, your kindness and humanity, um, their examples in which I continue to find incredible inspiration. Thank you very much to the panelists. Uh, now we have about a half hour where we can just have an open discussion, make comments, ask questions of our panelists based on what I take to be two main topics that have been introduced to us. One uh, having to do with questions of peoplehood and the other having to do with um, the profession of political science. And there is some parallel because I think the uh, tenor of both sets of remarks, uh, David's to begin, and then Rob and Amy's uh, to end with, are that um, these are um, constructive endeavors that are meant for us to shape and reshape and that shouldn't be taken as given, um, not just uh, a conception of, of political solidarity and peoplehood, but uh, a conception of political science. Uh, and so I see that at least as one of the parallels, how we should understand our responsibility or possibilities to create either our political communities or our professional uh, uh, roles. Um, as, as I, oh, there's a question already from Ira Katz Nelson, and then from Eric Ortz. So we'll go to Ira first, please, and then to Eric. Uh, thanks. Um, but these were three wonderful presentations. Uh, thank you. Um, a, a word to each, and they're a tribute as they should be to, to Rogers. Um, for the inspiration that has made this kind of work uh, possible. Uh, to Amy, simply a statement to say what your report um, reminds me of is the way in which uh, dissident intellectuals in the late 80s in East and Central Europe uh, took it upon themselves in very dark and uncertain times to live as if they were in a, a, an inclusive and fair and open democratic culture. And um, in effect, that's the kind of political science uh, Rogers and the task force and uh, the work that you described has been doing. And uh, it's, it's a fundamental uh, importance, even at a moment when we have so many reasons for pessimism. Um, to David, a, a question um, simply um, having to do with um, what reflection you might have that grows out of literature um, which Hannah Arendt actually underscored about the difference between, um, in, in her studies of anti-Semitism, um, between um, social and political anti-Semitism. That is to say, the, the bigotry, the prejudice of civil society becomes particularly dangerous when it becomes an instrument of politics. And your talk, uh, provocatively and interestingly, um, and at one or two moments terrifyingly, um, uh, indicates that democratic uh, 
politics, not just Arendt's totalitarian politics, um, uh, generates political, imminently generates politically grounded uh, bigotry through the politicization of peoplehood. And I'm wondering how you think about the conditions under which that worst case um, uh, happens and the conditions that restrict uh, bigotry, which is always there, um, to the social realm as opposed to the political realm. And finally, to, um, uh, to Rob, um, I, I want to raise a, a, a flag that says um, the distinction which you quoted, Bob Dahl wrote exactly what you quoted, but I don't think he lived by those quotes, by that quote. Um, that is from his very earliest work on uh, Marxist parties and on Congress and foreign policy and on atomic energy to the preface to democratic theory to who governs and beyond, the passion was for how to make the institutions and processes of uh, constitutional liberal democracy work. And the behavioral piece is to say that to do constitutional um, and legal and historical work isn't enough unless we know what motivates actors, including mass actors, um, as well as elite actors in the, in, in the polity. So I, I actually associate, if Rogers will allow me, associate Roger Smith with emphases not identical to Bob Dahl's, but as belonging to the same powerful family, which insists that it's the task of political science to understand analytically and empirically and theoretically um, how to make um, decent democracy. Um, survive and thrive in a very dangerous world. Thank you for those reflections and questions. Let's hear back from the panelists about them, uh, maybe in the order that you uh, provided them, Amy uh, uh, and then Robin David. Sure, thank you so much, Ira, for your, your comments. I agree, I think there's a little bit of um, faith. We're sort of um, stepping out into a zone that you know, we're hoping is going to have a firm foundation, um, you know, building that cohort and sort of um, by cohort by cohort building that critical mass. I think there is a little bit of faith in that, that the, that our efforts are going to pan out. Um, but again, I've been bolstered every time I have any worries um, and any time any of our participants express worries about, you know, the the timeliness of their ability to take on some of these kinds of projects, um, you know, their concerns about the discipline more generally. Um, I've been bolstered by the fact that our alums seem to be really thriving. And that's been something that's been um, just very um, affirming to the overall project. But I think there's more that we can do. And so that's a little bit why I was mentioning it today, because I do think we need um, we need broader support for these kinds of initiatives um, beyond the folks who initiated them and even beyond the members of the different cohorts, because many of them are um, very junior in their careers. And so for them, this is something that they um, they are going to need the support of others to be able to make sure that they can receive recognition, um, um, that the sort of work is is valued within the discipline. So it's a little bit an act of faith, a little bit like you alluded to, but I think it's it's well-grounded faith at this point so far. Thank you, Ari. Those are, those are wonderful questions. I guess like the, the big answer I would have is, oh, I wish I knew. Um, I wish I knew what uh, the constraints or what sort of the conditions were for restricting the political mobilization of bigotry. Um, and I think, but one way I've been thinking about it is simply, uh, you know, there's the question of alternatives and there's the question of costs, right? So when there is, you can imagine a situation in which having more options on the table for how you, uh, uh, for how you build large scale political majorities, that that might be, make some of those options more attractive than sort of going the, the route of uh, hate. That said, anti-Semites are anti-Semites and, <laughs> and they like anti-Semitism. There's something attractive to it that they want that, that is a thing that they want. And so ultimately, I think the, the only other response is you need to put costs on them for doing so. And those costs can happen through various types of organized networks. There was, um, uh, uh, Truman argued that it really needed to be held at sort of like a meso-elite level of your sort of 
your, your, from your union leaders to your lodge club, to your political party members, that type of mezzo elite, they needed to be committed to checking those types of things when they saw it. Um, but that's not especially reliable either. At the large scale, if you might find yourself in a situation where you can change the overall balance of politics by democratizing reforms, by increasing participation, by right? decreasing uh, hurdles to access. There's limits to how far you can go in that. Uh, for a while, I had thought that the United States was maybe lucky because it was in a situation where it could, uh, it could simultaneously check authoritarian and uh, populist far right positions by engaging in acts of democratic expansion. Um, I think that maybe that time frame has passed uh, and I worry that that time frame has passed, but I don't think there is a good answer. And that's ultimately my, my basic terror is that this is something that democratic politics will constantly reproduce and there's no constraint. Um, uh, thanks to Ira for, for um, thinking about Dahl um, uh, in a much more nuanced way than I presented him. And I think, you know, of course, uh, he's absolutely right about, about Dahl, whose career was and whose work was, was powerfully framed by a normative commitment to, um, to democracy. And he spent, spent decades trying to think about what that means how it can best be instantiated in a regime and how well or poorly the United States has approximated it in various ways. Um, so I think that's absolutely true of Dahl. The quotation though um, um, was, a, you know, a, a, an extremely crisp statement of an orientation that many of our colleagues have adopted sort of wholesale without the normative frame or without the connective um, tissue that links the work that we do as scholars and as scientists to the challenges that the world poses for us. Um, and I think, um, I think, you know, Rogers, as Amy said um, really nicely, um, Rogers' work was a real rebuke to that orientation that, that may have, you know, emerged from a sort of distortion of the values that, that the scientific values that Dahl and others in that era espoused. Um, um, and I think, you know, if we, could, if we could all be more like the Bob Dahl that you described, um, rather than the Bob Dahl who's represented in that one cherry-picked quotation that I, that I quoted, um, I think we'd all be better off. Uh, okay, Eric Ortz, please. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, well, first of all, this has been a really amazing conference. I'd like to thank Jeff and, and Rogers and everyone who has been involved with it. Um, I'm somewhat of an interloper from the worlds of law and business, but I'm happy to follow Ira and to throw out a lifeline of legitimacy that he was my, he was a professor of mine in the days of political science study. Um, but the question I have has to do with um, the the construction of the political in the in uh, or political people against the far right uh, mechanisms that are, we're seeing being used. So Serena mentioned earlier that Twitter it looks like Elon Musk will let Trump back on Twitter, and we have Fox News, we have. Uh, religious movements, there are a lot, it seems like there are a lot of movements that are creating um, a new kind of political personhood of a kind that many of us are concerned about. And so my question for the panel is, what are the ways in which that can be countered? So ideas that come to mind are, um, should we reinforce national service so that people have a better sense of, of being persons from their, from their, uh, from, from a young age of interactions? Uh, is there, should we reinforce exchange programs of some kind? Or is there, is there more that can be done? And I know that a number have, uh, a number of you on the, on the call here have worked on this. Is there more to be done in the university system of, how, of creating that sort of thing? Not just to introduce people and get them to talk to each other, but to actually create uh, this kind of a, a personhood that is uh, of a more beneficial kind. Um, does the panel want to address this question? Maybe Dave. Uh, I'll, 
Rob? I'll, I'll, I'll just take, I, I don't have the answer. I don't have a, much of an answer to your question. Um, I will say I just had a stack of papers from undergraduates in a class I'm teaching where I asked them essentially that question, you know, was a semester of gloom and doom about American democracy. And then the final paper was, well, what can we do? Um, and so, um, you know, what makes me a little bit optimistic is not that any of them came up with the silver bullet, but that there's real thinking um, and engagement um, um, with, with this problem among people, who, among young people who are studying political science. Um, so I think that's helpful. And that, that reminds me of something that, I, that I, I forgot to say in answer to Ira before, which is that for those of us who teach American politics, it, I feel like it's getting harder and harder to teach American politics or to teach political science from even from a sort of modified version of this dispassionate scientific stance, right? The world is burning around us. And this is not the time, the building is burning down. This is not the time to be talking about the intricacies of the engineering that made it stand up, right? Um, uh, so this sort of orientation about, uh, to ask exactly that question, you know, what can we do? And what is political? What is our? What does political science tell us that we can do in the world to fix some of the problems that we observe? That stance is becoming really, really important, both for us as teachers and scholars, and as 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 Amy described, civically engaged um, um, professionals. Well, I might just add to that a tiny bit, which is um, so you know, as much as I make the call for us to do more work that is, you know, connected to communities, again, in line with some of Rogers' um, arguments, I do think we have to have some humility as scholars about the role that we can play. Um, I also think, to me, something that doesn't always get mentioned as much um, among Rogers' work, and I don't want to take the role of what would Rogers say in this situation, but I would say I've been um, really pleased with how much he's emphasized the importance of teaching um, as part of his scholarship on the discipline as well. And so I do sort of echo a little bit of what Rob was saying about our role as teachers, um, that that is a big way in which we can contribute to um, civic discourse, um, civic education in the country. And I guess the last thing I just would say is, you know, I think we've seen some examples today from some of the scholars who've been on the different panels about the kind of work that can be very um, impactful, um, you know, listening to Kathy Cohen talking about some of her ongoing research um, just you know, reminded me of, of how important that sort of work is doing, especially her focus on, um, on young people of color, um, on political participation and their political views. I think to me, um, that's the kind of work that I, I hope can contribute and probably has the greatest likelihood of being able to contribute to um, the kinds of things that you mentioned. I would just say one thing that I also I, I don't have an answer. I have my suspicions about, um, and I, I guess I'd be opposed to sort of bringing back national service in part because I don't think it's worth the cost. And I would also sort of like I don't want I don't think we should make too much out of unity. Um, I, I think this unity can reach levels that are dangerous, but I don't think we should sort of prioritize reminding everybody that they're all from like that there's too much of a we there. And in fact, maybe just one thing we should do is try to actually make politics less about who we are, um, possibly <laughs> uh, at some point. But I feel like we have to like, you have to win the struggle of who you are before you can do that. So I don't have any good answer, although I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't shy away from conflict and lean too heavily into unity. So uh, in the interest of time, we're gonna try to link uh, two questions and uh, have the panelists have a chance to respond to either or both of them. Uh, the first will come from Amel Ahmad and then from Lester Spence. Hi, thank you. Uh, thanks to the panel and everyone who's been here today. I've learned a lot and I've been uh, more captivated than I thought would be possible now over two years into our Zoom existence. Uh, but these have been really, really great panels. And I wanted to um, pose some thoughts, hopefully with a question mark somewhere in there, uh, but about this theme that, that has been recurring throughout the day of the ideas that people have and what we can or should do about them. So it's a large kind of abstract question, but it occurred to me that there, there are two models that have emerged over the course of the day. One is that you know, there are ideas out there that are problematic for democracy and or for uh, you know, just living in community. 
Um, and so one way to understand our roles is that our job is to counter those, is to offer narratives that counter those. So there are exclusionary visions and we bring in inclusionary visions as a kind of counter. And this is uh, you know, often how I've thought about it, but over the course of these discussions, it's occurred to me that maybe I'm not thinking about this correctly. Um, and this, started, this idea started percolating actually with Kathy Cohen's presentation, which I thought was fantastic. And the idea of uh, the, the white vulnerability racism as a, a different category of attitude. And, and what I thought was interesting about this and potentially a way to get out of this binary um, is that it's an approach that really recognizes the contingency of the different components of identity. So we know that identity is constructed, but encountering it, we often you know, take for granted that construction as, as a whole. Um, and, and it seemed like what she was doing was trying to break apart the components and say, we can take these parts of it that may be problematic and redirect or re-guide them. Um, and so you know, perhaps that is a better reading of stories of peoplehood and a better reading of, of how we uh, you know, approach this, this attitude, which you know, I think for some people doesn't sit well. What should we be doing? Do we really engage in this politics of peoplehood and how do we do that responsibly um, rather than you know, coming up with our own alternative or our own counter um, to, to acknowledge the, the, the highly contingent, not just intersectional, but really contingent nature of the different components of identity. Thank you. Yes, yeah, a natural um, follow up from that. I, uh, when, when Adolf was speaking earlier, he talked about Jessica Blatt's work on American politics and Rob referenced the role of scientific racism in the discipline. If you look at uh, every subfield, it's not just American politics, every single subfield of political science was constitutively, constitutively racist. So Rob is right in talking about how there's been a, a pushback and Roger's work represents a kind of a pushback to that. But, but I think that there is a way in which political science should really reflect on the conceptual apparatus by which it's articulated concepts. That's different than the type of stories we tell. That's different than suggesting that we carve a path for political scientists to be more actively engaged in politics. That actually, what I'm suggesting is that political science itself should be rewritten. Now, the one institutional modification that I don't think has been talked about, although to be fair, I've only seen two panels, is the institutional attempt by Rogers at I think two departments to reorient how the discipline is taught. Yale doesn't do it anymore, but I think he did a Yale, he articulated a different way to deal with the four subfield issue. And I'm pretty, and I, I know he did it at Penn and it, it, it may still exist, it may have fallen through. So I was wondering if, if two of the panelists, Rob and I work on this at Hopkins, so I don't, really don't wanna hear from Rob, although Rob can speak to it for everybody else's benefit. I wanna hear the, the panelists talk about that possibility, that political science itself may have to be rewritten given the unique role race plays in the discipline. And then, in as much as I'm asking Rob to step up, step off, I was wondering if it's possible for Rogers to step in that role and talk about his conception in trying to reorient the, dis the, the discipline through those two departmental initiatives. Thank you. Great. Thank you for those two questions and comments, which will be the last ones for our um, panel today. Let's give each of the panelists a chance to uh, say some words, and then I believe we're going to hear from Rogers himself. So, um, Amy, did you want to get things started in response to these two sets of comments and questions? Thank you for that intervention, Lester. Um, nice to meet you. Um, I would say, you know, to me, I think the first thing is for us to grapple with the history. And I think that that, to me, is the, the most significant starting point um, that at least maybe folks can agree upon um, is to really understand the ways in which race has functioned in the discipline more generally over time. Um, if I'm being honest, I'm, I've always had a little bit of a tenuous connection to political science, partly because of some of those things. And so I think, um, you know, I have found spaces in other disciplines that I think are often a little bit 
you know, they're not without their own challenges, but maybe they've they've been grappling with it in an open way for a little bit longer than we have, or they recognize some of those things. Um, so I would say I don't have all the answers. I wish I had all the answers to your really brilliant questions, but I would say um, to me, the first part is for us to um, share a same sense of the past of our discipline. Um, and again, I, I go to, you know, to Rogers's comments um, and sort of my interpretation of them in that 2004 piece, which was really to say, if you want to claim, you know, being part of political science, if you, that's part of how you um, define yourself, then you have to be able to grapple with our past history. And in fact, responsibilities come from that. It's not, um, we can't take the good parts without the more challenging parts. Um, so I do think that work is still being done, but my hope is that, um, you know, I've seen changes in the time since I've been a, a political scientist professionally. Um, I feel like there is a possibility that comes from especially some of these initiatives, but other things that other, other um, folks in the discipline have been doing to try to not only create engagement, but make the spaces more inclusive um, to really have those tough conversations. Um, but I, I wish I had all the answers for you, but I, I don't have all the answers. I'm sure um, you kind of knew that when you posted that we wouldn't have all the answers to that question. But I would say we are gaining some leverage on some of those things um, through the types of work that especially the task force, but just again, other um, segments of the discipline have been advancing. So I, I can jump in because uh, Rob Lester does not want to hear from you. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm, I, I I'm used to it. <laughs> I couldn't agree more that ultimately there needs to be a summary thinking of the concepts and even beyond and grappling with the history and even beyond rethinking the concepts, I think that there should be a rethinking of the posture. I um, mean, Rogers in a different piece has talked about how political science has always aspired to uh, meaningful, meaningfully, meaningfully contributing to democratic life. And I think that that's important and that's something that should be valued. But there is a degree to which much of many of the ways that political scientists and political science work early on justified racial hierarchy was precisely as a solution to problems of democracy, right? It saw and justified various forms of segregation as solving the frictions of democracy. And so that changing the posture, at least being more humble, which was, I, I believe, brought up by Amy, a humility about, well, one, do we actually know what we are doing um, and how much do we know what we are doing? and then changing the composition of political science. So it's not the, the people who have a sense of what they're doing also have specific interests about what that solution is gonna be. And so I, I do think that on rethinking the concepts, rethinking the practices, rethinking the history, or better understanding the history and rethinking a little bit our posture and how we relate to sort of democratic politics itself would be valuable. Yeah, I really have very little to add. And as David said, Lester doesn't want to hear from me. Um, I will just say that that um, I'll just put in a plug for the work that we're beginning to do at Johns Hopkins, mostly under the leadership of Lester and our colleague Robbie Shilliam, um, to think about some of these questions. Um, and again, not just in American politics, where a lot of this work has already, this thinking has begun in the last few decades, but across the entire discipline. Um, and I feel like um, Rogers, among other people, sort of set this pebble rolling down uh, the hill, and it's starting really starting to gather steam in a productive way. Um, thank you all for this panel. Uh, we'll let Rogers have the concluding words for the day. Thank you so much. I'll respond first to uh, Lester by uh, noting that it was really uh, Ian Shapiro, who has been part of this conference, that um, uh, pushed for the restructuring of subfields and hiring at Yale. And I did try to do something similar at Penn. Um, and it didn't really uh, endure either place, although there are other departments around the country, including Duke and some others, uh, that have moved in that direction. And it uh, does point to the uh, uh, challenges of institutional uh, change. At the same time, uh, there has been uh, significant change in the discipline as a whole, uh, in part because political scientists have participated 
participated as uh, Amy has done uh, in a wide range of other uh, programs and initiatives in the uh, academy. And ultimately, I think the internal structure of the discipline uh, will uh, reflect uh, the changes that different kinds of centers and programs that political scientists um, are involved in um, have contributed. Uh, and that includes uh, uh, the Andrea Mitchell Center. And I do want to close by uh, thanking very much Jeff Green, Matt Roth, and everyone at the Andrea Mitchell Center, all the uh, uh, panelists today that have uh, contributed such great discussions, um, and all of you uh, uh, who have Zoomed in. Um, it is uh, really uh, just uh, uh, so moving to see uh, so many uh, uh, friends and former students and colleagues and uh, some family members, including one of my great brothers and uh, uh, Mary Summers, who has been my partner in everything I've done for the uh, last uh, 35 years. Um, and uh, I do want to say that I chose um, during my time on university faculties uh, to try to uh, contribute uh, through scholarship and teaching and professional and uh, institutional service uh, uh, because I got a lot of satisfaction out of doing uh, all those things. Uh, there are people who have, this has been a day devoted to exaggerating my contributions. The reality is uh, that um, uh, there are not only people who have achieved more as scholars, as teachers, um, as uh, people uh, providing institutional service, um, uh, there are people who have done more uh, individually in all three areas than I have done. Um, uh, but uh, I do think uh, that there aren't very many uh, who have felt as privileged as I always have uh, to be able to pursue this career. And I don't think that there are many who, despite uh, the um, uh, difficult stresses and uh, frustrations along the way at times. I don't think that there are any uh, who have had more fun doing it uh, than I have uh, for uh, more than four decades. And that is um, uh, partly because uh, I'm such a nerd, but uh, it's also uh, chiefly uh, because I've gotten to interact uh, with really wonderful people. Uh, like all the ones on the Zoom call. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. I think we're going to end it there. Thank you, Rogers. Um, be well, everyone. Have a nice evening.